This is Who's Hungry and Homeless in College. I am here to talk about the um, effects of food and housing insecurity among college students, because there's a pretty big gap in resources there. Um, and this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as part of a media assistance grant donated to the ASUM Renter, Renter Center. And um, please stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, these buttons are really sensitive. Um, there's no dumb questions here. This is really important information to spread, so please let me know. Um, about me real fast, my name is Kat. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm a graduate student in the public administration program, and I currently work at the ASUM Runner Center as the outreach coordinator. Um, soon I'm going to be starting in the new UM Food Pantry as the student coordinator there. I'm really excited about. Um, and I got started with this work um, with the help of my boss, Jordan Lyons. I was able to facilitate bringing the real college survey to campus. Um, if any of you are students here, you would have seen that in your email inbox a while back, and that survey was meant to collect um, some real data on who at UM is facing basic needs and security, because until we get those results, we don't have any numbers. Um, the food bank can give us some, but it's not all they have is who's coming to the food bank. So this should give us a far more comprehensive look at um, who is facing this here. And uh, I was also able to attend the Real College convening. They um, gave me a scholarship and I was fully funded, which was awesome. And um, that gave me a lot of really good ideas on ways to solve basic needs and security here. Um, we were able to network with other campuses and see what their single stop centers or resource centers or food pantries look like. So that's why I do what I do. So you've heard all the jokes about college students surviving off of ramen. I'm sure you've told them, I know I have. Um, and that isn't what college is supposed to be like. We should be able to afford actual good nutritious food um, instead of 30 cent noodle packets. Um, that's a real problem and that's a pretty harmful stereotype that has normalized this trauma um, because not being able to afford food or housing in college isn't normal and it's not okay. Um, I know that's not what my parents went through. When my parents were in school in 1982 and 1978, mom and dad respectively. Um, they worked over the summer and that was kind of it. They were able to afford food and apartments and tuition, no problem. In 82, when my mom started at Gonzaga University, tuition was maybe 4,000 a semester, which is less than in-state tuition here now at a state-funded school. Um, since then, it's gone up about 10 times. This year, it was around 40,000. And that is a private school, but it shows how quickly tuition has jumped up all over the country. Um, and the same thing happened here. Tuition right now in-state is about 7,000, a little over. Um, Out-of-state is about 24,000. Uh, 24, when I started here in 2014, in-state was around 6,000. Out-of-state was 22,000. So even in just four years, we've gone up one to $2,000 in both those categories. And when you add fees, textbooks, cost of living to that, those numbers get a lot scarier. Um, and even in-state, you're gonna be around 20,000. Um, so here's a little map of how our tuition has risen here at UM. Um, that's a pretty sharp jump, and you can see it kind of started to get bad around 2001, 2002. And this um, website was able to give me this map for almost every state, every college. Um, and this is what everywhere looks like. There's not really a state where tuition has stayed level. And some of that makes sense with inflation and all that, but wages have not gone up to support the rising cost of schools. And that's left students in a pretty scary situation. Um, and when you add cost of living to that, to that, especially in Missoula, we have some of the highest rate, uh, rent in Montana. Um, that, you know, is scary and it adds a huge cost to um, cost of attendance here. And that is a burden that falls right on students. Um, minimum wage is only $8.30. When I moved to Montana, it was only $8. Uh, and I grew up in Washington where minimum wage is rising to 13 bucks in some areas. So that, um, I don't know how anyone can live off of 8.30. I'm, I have two jobs. When I started graduate school, I had three jobs. Um, I had to quit one because I couldn't manage to study and work all that time, but um, it's scary. It's scary, it's, uh, and there's not enough supports. Um, and another big issue with this is that 
when schools are reporting the cost of living to financial aid offices, to the feds, um, they might not have the most accurate numbers. In some cases, cases, we've seen two schools in the same city reporting different costs of living. And it looks like they tend to estimate on the lower end. Um, so then students aren't getting more financial aid to support cost of living on top of tuition, which again leaves us in a spot where we're having to choose, do we buy that textbook or do we pay rent this month? Because textbooks, I've had a few that cost almost as much as my rent, um, which is a whole other problem. So let's talk about perceptions. I built in some areas for discussion in my presentation, because um, if we don't talk about the problem, how are we going to solve it? So let's start with um, what does homelessness, homelessness look like? And how does um, college homelessness differ from that? So I'll start with the Housing and Urban Development Office's definition of homelessness, which is people who are living in a place not meant for human habitation, in an emergency shelter, in transitional housing, or are exiting an institution where they temporarily resided. But there are a lot of things that that definition doesn't cover, especially if you're a college student. So. Yeah, let's get this conversation started. Does anyone have any perceptions? There's no wrong answers here, and I want you to be really comfortable and being uncomfortable having this conversation. It's hard to talk about. I get that. Yeah? I think that like general homelessness, we think a lot about the people living on the streets, mm -hmm. downtown, sleeping in front of shops. And that isn't what I think about when I think about homeless students. Mm -hmm. I think about maybe couch surfing. Yeah. That sort of thing. That's a big one. Yeah? Yeah. Years ago when I was teaching here, I found out that one of my students, who looked like everybody else, mm -hmm. uh, sort of overworked and tired and all that kind of thing, had been living in her car for yeah. 10 days. And I just didn't know anything about it. And mm -hmm. I don't know who did know anything about it because we didn't have anybody to talk to about that. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else? Other ideas? Bad. Well, you all hit the nail on the head. Um, you can't tell, honestly, especially in college, especially because of the stigma that surrounds homelessness. Um, often those of us who do end up in that situation are too scared or too embarrassed to tell anyone, or we're afraid that um, the perceptions that other, people's ha other people have of us will change. So this is what I looked like when I was homeless last year. Um, most of the people I was interacting with on campus didn't know because I didn't want them to. Um, at this time, I had just left an unsafe living situation, and I was living in my aunt's basement. Um, I had my laundry basket full of mostly clean clothes and anything I could fit in my car. And uh, I did my best to make sure no one knew. I, this was during um, lobbying for final budgeting for ASUM Senate. So every single day, I had that blazer, this pair of jeans, and these shoes, actually. Um, they're nice shoes. I still like them. Um, and I spent most of my time on those days making sure no one could tell, like making sure I found a way to shower at my aunt's house. Um, I had friends who had meal plans at the time, so I, they were buying me food when I disclosed to them like, hey, I can't eat. Um, so it's, you can't tell because we could look like anyone and also because we don't want you to know. And that's a big problem with college homelessness, right? If we have, if that stigma persists, no one's going to be willing to reach out and ask for help. So we have to make sure we're breaking down these harmful stereotypes and that we're breaking down that stigma and educating each other that it's fine. Anyone could be a few days away from being in this situation. I know I wasn't expecting to be. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones. I was able to get into the dorms. Um, thanks to my very generous and loving grandmother, I had a little bit of a college fund to fall back on. Um, even so, it cost me about two grand or more to get into the dorms and buy that meal plan and that really affected how much I had to work um, over the next couple of years to earn that money back. So not everyone's that lucky though, and we have to remember that. Um, I have friends that spend a lot of time couch surfing because they didn't have any other options. Um, and Shantae Harris is another student who shares my story. She did a TEDx talk a few years ago in Michigan. I have the citation later in my slide if you want to see it. but. Um, she talked about how she made the dean's list every single semester until in the, during the 2008 recession, she lost her home. Um, and I saw that happen to a lot of people growing up in Spokane. I was just entering high school when that recession hit really hard. Um, so a couple weeks after she became homeless, lost her home, 
she was failing almost every class. And I felt that also. I failed a test the day after I moved out. And as wonderful and caring as that professor was, he couldn't let me just retake it because I was sad, which is fair. Um, I did get my grade back up. I got an A in that class. I'm really proud of it. Um, and Shantae, once she found housing again, once she had the resources that she needed, also academically she improved and she now works in higher education, advocating for other students going through what she went through back then. Um, and then we've had a couple stories that the Kaiman published here about uh, one student who was living on the Kim Williams Trail in February after the rental house he was living in burned down and he couldn't afford to go somewhere else. And he'd worked in the Forest Service, he was comfortable with camping, um, but still it's not an ideal situation, right? It's cold, especially in Montana, being homeless in January and February is life threatening. It's just so cold. And then my junior year here, 2015, um, sophomore year maybe, the Kaiman published another story about a student living in his van because he couldn't afford to live in a dorm. And when I moved here, uh, 2014, dorms cost about 2,000, maybe a little more. So I was spending about four grand just living expenses living here on campus. That doubled what I was paying for school. And that was really scary. Um, that guy also thought it was really scary and chose to live in a Chevy like Sprinter van with his dog. And he, you know, the article's very jokey, like, isn't this weird and quirky? Um, and kind of could have done a little more to point that this is a serious problem. Um, just like all the GoFundMe campaigns for someone who can't afford medical costs. Looks so sweet and caring, but there's a bigger problem at the root of that um, that isn't being discussed. So just like homelessness, there's plenty of other problems that more people need to be educated on. So this is Dr. Sarah Goldrick Grab. She's a sociologist and a professor of higher education at Temple University. She runs the Hope Center for College Community and Justice. She's on the cutting edge and the forefront of um, researching basic needs and security among college students. She wrote the Real College Survey, uh, which hopefully you saw in your inbox here. And she ran the Real College Conference. She's my hero, and she follows me on Twitter. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> she retweets me sometimes. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so she went on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, which is really cool that such a big platform was handed to her so she could get the word out more. Um, and Trevor Noah was a great guy, and they had a really awesome interview and conversation. Um, but she went on the show to talk about anyone could be homeless. Like, the problem is everywhere and affects every kind of person on a campus. I know we have staff members here who are probably struggling to afford rent and groceries as well because our pay in Montana is just so low. Um, and that's terrifying because we grow up assuming that if we work hard, if we get a full-time job, we'll be able to afford to live in a house, maybe an apartment, buy food. Um, and it's really scary to grow up and see that that's a myth. Um, Mr. Rogers didn't tell me that I was going to have three jobs in college. Um, but I did take a lot of fashion advice from him. I wear a lot of sweaters. <laughs> um, so yeah, Sarah Goldrick Rab found in 2017 when she was still working at uh, Wisconsin, um, through the Wisconsin Hope Lab that 70 community colleges in 24 states had 14% of homeless college students. And there's a lot of reasons why community colleges might have a higher rate of homelessness. You have to think about who goes to which school. Um, and that's not placing a value judgment on two years over four years or vice versa. But often community college students are older or they're coming out of the workforce and going back into school, or they are lower income because SACES cost less in general, um, and maybe more parents are at community colleges. So especially when we're looking here in Montana at who needs help, we need to keep our eye on Missoula College, West Campus, and the Bitterroot to make sure they have resources that are gonna be harder to get at smaller schools than they are at four year, like here. Um, and CSU did a similar, uh, California State University did a similar study and found that eight to 12% of its students were homeless. So Wisconsin, California, um, and the other 22 states on that list all found very similar numbers that they have a much higher rate of homelessness than they were expecting. We know that last year, um, Missoula Food Bank served about 400 students. It's almost 4% of our campus, and that's just food insecurity. And we know that a lot more students should have been going to the food bank, but they don't think it's for them. They don't know how to get there. They don't know what those intake forms look like. They're embarrassed. Um, and it's important to know that Missoula Food Bank is there to serve everyone. I've been there. They gave me food. 
um, and they're really awesome people. And we have a really strong community in Missoula, which is amazing. So Sarah Goldrick Rabb said that um, college students couch surf. These popular images can obscure more ominous realities. Hunger and the little acknowledged problem that some do not have a place to live at all. So that's going back to couch surfing and this idea that that's normal and fine and normalizing this problem makes the problem bigger. So remind your friends like, hey, heard you were sleeping on someone's couch, are you okay? And when they inevitably tell you that they're fine, ask them what fine means in their world right now. Because again, I spent so much time covering up the fact that I was struggling so hard because it's embarrassing. But why is it embarrassing? There's this never ending cycle of I don't want people to know I need help, so I'm not going to ask for help, but then I need more help. Um, so check on your friends and don't believe them the first time when they say they're fine. Um, it's a cycle that needs to be broken. And then. So yes. can I assume that you, you won't have a uh, percentage rate of UM students who have been in this? Not yet. Uh, we, because we just ran the real college survey, we will have those numbers in February. Would students admit they would probably won't say, yes, I am? And that's, yeah, that's the issue with surveys. Um, we have to hope that people are being honest yeah. and answering um, truthfully. And we did provide a pretty big incentive to take their survey. So hopefully the people that took it were honest. But you do have to account for that margin of they're too embarrassed even on that. And the survey was completely anonymous. Um, you were able to put in your email at the end if you wanted to be entered to win $100, but um, you didn't have to. I didn't, mostly because it was a conflict of interest. But um, hopefully, I'm really hopeful people answered honestly. But that is a fear that I have. You're absolutely right. Um, so a president of LaGuardia Community College, this is the best quote I found in the months of research I was doing, because often, um, I haven't heard it as much on this campus, but you hear that, uh, well, we're here to educate people. We're not here to feed them or clothe them or give, their some, give them somewhere to live. We're here to educate them, and that's it. But he said, uh, we're not a social service agency. We want to educate students. But in order to do that, they can't be hungry and they can't be homeless. So pointing to me and Shantae Harris failing classes the very next day of losing our houses or in the next few weeks, um, you can't learn and you can't focus in classrooms if you're so busy thinking about where am I going to eat tomorrow, where am I going to sleep tonight, did I shower, will I be able to shower this week. Um, and that kind of trauma is going to distract you from being in school. Yeah. So this problem exists here. The Renner Center ran a very short, very informal survey out of our listserv, email listserv. And we asked people through Qualtrics, which is completely anonymous and confidential, um, do you have a, short, a story to share? And because of this, and because some people did share their stories, I'm hopeful people were honest taking the real college survey. Um, so here's three quick responses. Um, this first one is, we've had to borrow money from his parents, referring to their boyfriend, um, which I really hate because I was taught that if I work hard, I should be able to afford what I need. So this points back to the bootstrap myth and that we're all taught growing up that you got to do it yourself. you got to yank yourself up from the bootstraps and you'll be fine. But because of social inequities that exist in this country and in this world, a lot of people need more assistance than that and that's okay. We should be lifting up people who need more help instead of telling them to do it themselves. This next one, um, there have been some months when I've lived off Nutter Butters. My grandma sent me in the mail. That's some shit. I've been there. My aunt just sent me a gift card to Starbucks, 15 bucks, so I can get like three cups of coffee. But like, that's free coffee for three days. Oh my God. Um, but why am I so excited? It's a cup of coffee. Just the fact that I don't have to pay for it means so much to me. Even now, I have somewhere to live. I have two great jobs. Um, I still struggle to get by sometimes. I barely made rent this month, um, and that's scary and not ideal. Um, and also, as great as Nutter Butters are, it's not a full meal. And then finally, and this is a really big problem that has many elements I want to discuss. Um, during Thanksgiving, winter, and spring breaks, I was always homeless for the week. Very scary time. So my freshman year living in the dorms, my parents got an email and I got an email right before spring break that said, hey, don't worry, your kid's not going to fly out to Florida or like Mexico or whatever. 
for, to party, they can stay here and have a great time on campus for spring break. That email failed to mention that there were no dining services open. So we were so excited, I was gonna save some money, not have to drive home, not have to fly somewhere for spring break. Uh, and then we realized the day before that the food zoo and most of the dining places on campus were gonna be closed. I believe Pizza Hut and maybe Noodles Express was still open, but like, I can't eat that <laughs> for seven days and they're not open for breakfast. Um, so my friends and I were lucky. One of us had a microwave, one of us had a refrigerator. We went to Walmart and stocked up on like frozen crap food because that's cheaper than eating out every single day. Um, and maybe that's changed since my freshman year, but that had a really big impact on me. It made me feel like my campus didn't care about me and didn't care about my well-being over the break. Because um, even if it's spring break or summer break, I'm still a student, right? It, yeah, it didn't make sense to me. Um, and hopefully something as the UM pantry gets set up that something we'll address. We'll make sure to give out more food right before breaks. Um, but especially now that the dorms are closed over winter break, I believe, so we no longer have winter session. If you can't afford to fly home, what are you gonna do? So this person and the rest of their survey talked about um, using Uber or Lyft to get to friends' houses and then get to work because also the bus routes didn't quite match up and it's hard to ride your bike in January. Um, so there's, this one little snippet of a sentence points to a way bigger problem. Um, and again, homelessness in Montana in January is life-threatening. So let's have another quick discussion. Um, and this points to resources. A big thing I've noticed in doing this research and talking to other students is that we don't know what is out there to help us, whether it's because it's not being advertised because it doesn't have a ton of funding or People are worried that someone who doesn't need it is gonna go to use that resource. I think that's fine as long as people who need it are also using that resource. Um, or they don't think students can use it, like the food bank. So, yeah, what resources are available to students facing these issues at UM, in Missoula, in Montana in general? Um, do you know who's aware of them and do you know who's able to access those? And what might be a barrier to access? Yeah? You know one thing, you know we're having citywide conversations about affordable housing and the lack of affordable housing yeah. and um, there are organizations that are building affordable housing but often with the way that those are funded students aren't eligible to live in them yeah and i think that that's a huge barrier that we need to address um, the, the argument is well the government funds student housing on campuses and so then this government funding shouldn't be used but it's, it's housing on campus isn't necessarily affordable and so trying to, I, that's just a larger issue I think that people should be aware of that, you know, when, when Home Order, the Missoula Housing Authority, builds a new affordable housing property, students aren't allowed to live there unless they have exited the foster care system. Yeah. Students who've lived in foster care can live in those, but I think that that's something that's really inequitable. I agree, that's huge. Yeah, and I think similar things are happening with supplemental nutrition assistance. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of regulations that require certain amounts of work requirement. Um, I think some of those are very tough for students to meet. I also think going the other direction, students aren't really aware of what those eligible requirements are and that they may qualify. Yeah. I had people tell me my first three years here that, oh, students can't get SNAP. Like you just, you don't qualify at all. But that's not true. It's about, unless you have kids, you have to work about 20 hours. Um, which is pretty scary, and there's a couple other like ways you can get in without the work requirements. But also, um, after you graduate, when you're listing um, things that your income goes towards to try and qualify for SNAP, you know, spending down, uh, student loan payments don't count. And for a lot of people, that is one of your biggest expenses every single month. Um, and that, to me, is a big problem. Um, just staring down the chute of what I'm going to have to pay back, I don't know how I'm going to do it. A lot of my friends don't know how they're going to do it. So that points to like three or four separate bigger problems. But yeah, misinformation about SNAP or just um, people not getting out and making sure people know about it is huge. I agree. Yeah? Can you talk about Yeah, that's the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, and that's um, what people used to call food stamps, or some people call it EBT. Um, but it's basically public assistance to buy food. It was awesome. And I worked at a grocery store for a long time, so I had a lot of practice with helping people navigate that system, at least on the consumer end. Yeah. And you'd be shocked. 
like how many different kinds of people use Snap and how many still um, misconceptions there are about people who use Snap and like, oh, it's just a handout from the government, but like, no, it's, it's real and it's good that it exists. Um, it's really important. It helps a ton of people in Missoula. Yeah. Anything else? What are other barriers or can you list like any resources that are available to students? Yeah. Sorry, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Homeward also offers a free financial education class. Yes, I'm taking those and they're awesome. Yeah. Katie yeah. Sadowski is a badass. She's a badass. <laughs> Correct. And so that's a good, I mean, for folks who are sitting looking down the pipe of student loan payments and maybe have been negligent about credit, health, mm -hmm. et cetera, because nobody teaches us that in college, that's a really good option. That's free for anyone and free child care. Um, the number one resource that comes to mind for me is Trio. I know it has yeah. a small fund for, um, I think, books. I'm not sure about food, if they're going to be involved in the food pantry side of things or not. Um, but then, of course, you do have to have a disability or Pell Grant eligible, yeah. low income, um, or a first generation student. And then I had a question. Yeah. Um, do you know if they talked about ever uh, making a Grizz plan? donation, like meal swipe donation program? Um, swipes? Yes, and I might have Trevor jump in if that's okay. Um, swipe Out Hunger exists. That's a program that a lot of colleges use where unused uh, swipes get put into this pool and then other people can use those swipes. Um, doesn't look like we're gonna bring that here. Hopefully we're looking at other solutions. Um, and I do know that Trio is gonna be, we're gonna be sending food to them from the UM Pantry. Um, and that they have a textbook lending library, which is really cool. But I don't know if there's anything you can add about. Yeah, I don't, I don't get too far ahead of some of the planning, but Danny is involved with a lot of these food insecurity discussions. And one of the things we're talking about is they revamp the meal plans pretty much every year. And so the next revamp offering guest swipes and then allocating, allowing those guest swipes to be donated. So swipe out hunger. Is a great organization, but they play this sort of third party role. So yeah. money gets diverted to them, and then they divert money back to your campus. So, dining has been looking at maybe doing sort of a homegrown program, similar, similar type of idea where you can say, you, know, you have five guest swipes, you could donate all five, you could bring your parents in, and you could do something like that. So, we're working on it, which is um, one of my favorite things about this campus is that when people see a need, they tend to try to fill it. Um, people work really hard to make sure students are okay here, and that's really awesome. Um, and I'm really excited that dining is getting involved in this. Um, it makes me feel really good. So yeah, anything else? Who might not know about these? Who should know about these? Yeah? I feel like a lot of people just don't know this. We feel like a huge factor of information the first kind of like the school leader, but no one really like that it's so much information you're right students um, I remember my orientation well I was there but I don't remember most of it because it was such an info dump that I couldn't keep track in my brain and it was the week after I graduated high school too so I was still like so scared about college um, and I almost wish that like in my junior year they were like hey remember all those things we told you here's them again so you actually remember um, but yeah I really think um, people who are aware of these resources need to do a better or people who like provide these resources should do a better job of making sure they're reaching the students that need them um, one idea that came out of real college is to include basic needs statements on syllabi like along with don't cheat and don't plagiarize and all that stuff um, and the disability statements that professors should be reminding their students that if you need help, help is out there. If you need someone to come talk to you, I'm available. Um, or even just a quick list of like, hey, SNAP, food pantry, food bank, textbook lending, like you have options. Um, especially because I definitely, I've had professors on this campus that I would, um, I went to with any problem. Uh, Beth Hubble in women's studies, Daisy Brooks in sociology. There are a lot of really awesome professors on this campus who just care so much. I know I took your mythology class my freshman year, and you like did so much to remind people that people learn in different ways, which is really awesome. So your faculty care, and hopefully, um, even if basic needs statements don't go on syllabi, you can go to them and say, hey, 
I need help, what do I do? And even if they don't know, hopefully maybe they get trained to know soon. So yeah, we need reminders. Yeah. And Missoula College students especially need to have better access to assistance, I agree. Yeah? I do just think that this, this is a microcosm problem of the way we've come to deal with systemic problems of all kinds in the United States. That is, we leave the individual thinking that it's his or her problem. Absolutely. Instead of emphasizing that it's really a systemic problem which needs a systemic response. And the more you just leave people hanging out there as individuals thinking, oh my gosh, why can't I mm -hmm. keep myself alive, whatever, at any level, whether they're students or parents or whatever, um, it's really a disservice to everybody. These are systemic problems and we need to acknowledge that and then try to come up with a systemic answer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as frustrating as some Band-Aid solutions might be, like I can give you a sandwich this week, um, that means a ton as someone who's been in that situation, both solutions to systemic issues but also so-called Band-Aid solutions meant so much to me. Um, so I think while we need to keep our eye on the systemic problem and we absolutely need to be working to solve it, also keep in mind that sometimes all I need is a sandwich um, and making sure we're bringing both together because I don't think we'll get anywhere if we don't have both. Yeah. Anything else? Awesome. Interrupt me whenever also. I love these conversations. Um, so yeah, here's your systemic problem um, or a picture of it. This is my favorite cartoon to explain um, inequities in this country. Uh, so first one, equality. Everyone has the same help. Everyone's pulling themselves up from their bootstraps. But our little guy in the purple shirt needs more help. They have been handed a, for whatever reason, they've been handed a lot in life that doesn't look like next person's lot. Um, and that's not fair, so we should maybe be doing more to help them. So here, equity, we've done more to help them. Um, because they were shorter and because they needed more help, they got more help, which is fine. Um, the taller dude didn't really need help. So um, this, you can just Google uh, justice and equity cartoon. I send this to people all the time when they're saying things I don't agree with. Um, I have a file of memes on my phone just for this solution. Um, but then here's our reality right now. Often people that need more help are left in the dirt or things that should go to them go to people who don't need it. Look at tax breaks for the wealthy, stuff like that. Um, and I have as someone who's been in this position because I'm a woman, because I'm queer, because I just dealt cards that I didn't know how to handle in life. Um, I know what it looks like to be sitting in a room and say, oh, well, why, why do they have all that? Why can't I help myself? Um, and reminding this person standing in a hole that that's not fair, and that they absolutely get to feel like that's not fair. Um, and reminding them that it's not their fault. People end up with basic needs and security for so many vast reasons. And often it does point to a bigger societal problem of just either the resources just aren't there or they're not being directed to those who need it. Um, so yeah, any work we do when we're working to solve this has to be equitable. We have to be helping people who need help more first. Uh, and it absolutely should involve students at every single level as um, Someone who served, this is my second term on ASUM Senate. I've been in so many meetings, committee meetings where I'm the only student in the room when they're talking about what students need. And through no fault of their own, many staff, professors, faculty, administrators just haven't been in college in like five, 10, 20 years. Um, just fine, they don't remember. Or their college experience was way different from what mine is. Um, solely because of the cost, but because society is changing and more people are going to school now that never could 10 years ago. First generation students, dreamers, immigrants, um, parents, single parents, low income students, people who never would have gotten the chance 10 years ago have gotten this uh, chance to escape the cycle of poverty by getting an education, but it's putting them right back there if they have to pay back loans, if they can't afford school. Um, which absolutely, I don't know how you feel, but it does not feel fair to me. Um, so we have to be equitable, we have to be scrappy, and um, we have to make sure everyone's involved at every level. Uh, I went to, at the Roll College convening, there was a section led by Sam Zucker about human-centered design, which is something I'd never heard of and that I'm nerding out about now. I think it's so cool. But making sure that um, 
The people are at the center of every solution we build. We have to be equitable, and especially on this campus, we have to be scrappy. These are very complex problems that are multifaceted and multi-leveled, and they need very creative solutions. So whether that's um, Oregon State University, I believe, has a really awesome food pantry with um, like clothes and textbooks and showers and washing machines and like an actual food pantry as well. But they also have this little forgot your lunch station right at the front that's like some bananas, power bars, sandwich, water bottles um, that anyone could walk in and use, which is awesome and I think a really cool creative solution. Um, we heard about Portland Community College. One of their campuses has what they call a co-op. So they, that's their food pantry. Um, and again, a lot of these places don't call it a food pantry to avoid that stigma. So I'm trying to think of creative names we could use here maybe, hit me up later. Um, so they call it the co-op and they say we have food and they always have like snacks available for anyone. So their student coordinator will like run out into the hallway and say, hey, do you want a muffin? Do you want a snack? Do you want some coffee real fast? And because it's free and because people like free stuff for many numbers of reasons, sometimes it's because we can afford it, sometimes it's because we like free stuff. Um, and that brings more people into the pantry who would never have seen it before. And maybe if they don't need it, they'll tell their friends. And they have an awesome lending library of like professional clothes for interviews. Um, a lot of people are getting really creative to solve these problems. And it's really um, inspiring. It makes me feel really good. So, um, yeah. May I ask one question about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Did you say anything about the Missoula food? Oh, you're going to say Oh, I have a whole thing. I promise. I love them. Um, yeah, so help us out there. Here's a very short list of things that exist for people. Um, emergency short-term loans, ASUM runs one, financial aid has one. Um, I know for ASUM, ours is up to 500 bucks. You have 90 days to pay it back, no interest, which is awesome. So if you're like, crap, I have to buy textbooks, I can't afford rent, this will pay for your rent or your textbooks or whatever other reason. You may need it, we don't judge. Um, financial aid, hopefully, if uh, cost of living is reported accurately, it'll help you out. It's not an option for everyone. Uh, Missoula Food Bank serves one in five Missoulians. That is a huge number, especially since their move over to Wyoming Street. Um, they've opened up a lot of other awesome ways to help. They have their Empower Place, they have childcare. Um, they're partnering with Homeward to build many homes outside right behind the food bank and they'll have a community garden. Um, those plans look really awesome. I'm really excited about it. But they do a ton. Right huh? The homes are for sale right now. Homes are for sale right now. One day I'll be able to afford a small home. Um, and I'm getting a lot of help through Homeward because I'm taking Katie Sadowski's financial fitness classes. Um, they're very cool. I really recommend them to anyone. Um, especially if you're like me and if I could keep my money in my mattress, I would. I don't trust credit cards. They don't make sense to me. They're very scary. But Katie is teaching me and she would teach you also. So yeah. Um, Homeward, Missoula Food Bank, um, which is actually in the middle of Can the Cats right now, and I, hopefully on my next slide, it's on there. If not, I will talk about it more. Um, emergency winter support, again, homelessness in Montana in January is life-threatening. There are programs to help you. There are programs to help pay for um, utilities, I think, if you need it in the winter. SNAP, awesome. The ASUM Renter Center is also very cool. Um, I'm a little biased because I work there and because my boss is great. That's Jordan Lyons. Um, <laughs> he, many of you may have gotten one of his 17 emails about me presenting today. Thank you for coming. Um, but yeah, uh, we have something on this campus that is really unique. We have a program that is here to advocate for student renters, especially somewhere like Missoula where renting is so hard. Our vacancy rate is super low. Our rents are super high. Landlords are aware that the vacancy rate is low and that um, you need housing and you'll take what you can get. Um, I've lived in some pretty lame apartments. Uh, my last one was, the one I actually had to leave last winter, uh, was in an attic. We couldn't stand up in the shower because it was in the corner of the attic, so we just like had a stool and worked for me, I'm pretty short, but the person I was living with was tall, so that was a problem. But um, we have people here to help if you need to find more affordable housing, if you need advice on like what to do if your landlord isn't working with you very well, Renner Center is here to help. Um, ASUM also offers low to no cost legal services for students. Um, so again, this is a very short list. There's a lot more out there, but I didn't want a death by PowerPoint, you all. So if there's other things that you want to mention right now, I invite you to plug them or give them a shout out. 
Yeah. So, so does the Missoula Food Bank particularly make contact with students in any way? That was going to be my question. So that yeah. they're not just sitting out there and nobody knows they're there. Yeah. So kind of. Um, I know Aaron, whose last name I forget. Brock. Yeah. Thank you. Aaron Brock um, has will come in and talk to students. Um, they're going to be at the ASUM Senate meeting next week to talk about can the cats and the food bank. Um, and Aaron and Kelly do like try to reach out. We do have a bus on campus that'll take you right in front of the food bank. So maybe a students are seeing it, but it should, I think there should be more advertising to students. I agree. And I think um, a lot of that comes out of Can the Cats as people just hear about the food bank more. Even so, my sophomore year when I really needed help, I didn't think I could go there because I'm a student and we're kind of taught that there aren't resources for us. Um, and in some ways that is true, but like anyone can go to the Missoula Food Bank. Go take a tour even, I really encourage you. They're doing some really amazing things. Um, and Aaron and Kelly and Amanda and all the other people that work there care about this community so much. It's really awesome. Yeah. Um, any other quick points? Yeah. Make a comment that um, at, through the um, Invest Hub, which I'm not going to go into what that is, but there's a group that's come together from different agencies, including the health department, and not me, it's somebody else. But they're really interested in housing issues, mm -hmm. and one of the things we've done is some learning in other communities. We've found some other um, North Iowa City and, um, oh, I forget. Okay, thank you. It was two words. Um, in Wisconsin to kind of learn how they deal with some of the housing issues with um, students and all. And there's some really interesting things that happen that um, are about some rent a rental inspection, you know, trying to bring houses up to COVID in a way that doesn't push lower rents out. That there's some really interesting stuff out there that we are precluded from doing because our state legislature won't let us do yep. any rent stuff. So yep. people are thinking about that and working on it, but it doesn't have much of a head of steam. Awesome. Um, and I know a lot of other programs are being built up on campus. Our pantry um, is going to be opening on February 2nd, hopefully, we'll, or February 1st, sorry, 2 1. Um, and hopefully, we're going to start getting food out to our satellites really soon. Uh, we did have a food drive through Family Night at Costco that gave us a good base of stuff to start. Um, which is really awesome. Montana Food Bank Network gave us a grant, so they gave us a mini fridge and some other ways to start work there, which is really awesome. And we're also partnering with Missoula Food Bank on just getting advice on how to start. Maybe they'll help us with volunteers down the line. Um, so yeah, cool. So questions and a quick call to action. Um, again, I'm going to talk about Missoula Food Bank because I just love them so much. Um, right now, we're in the midst of Can the Cats. I have bags by the door for you to collect food or get ideas on how to help if you can. Um, they have a cool list of like three ways to help right now. And the reason that I love Can the Cat so much is because it does so much to bring dignity back to shopping at the food bank because I get so much variety. You're no longer walking to the food bank and getting the same broccoli, green beans, bread, soup that you might get uh, when they're only able to get like the same stuff every week. Can the Cats brings in so much variety that makes it feel like a normal shopping trip. That makes it feel like um, it brings dignity and humanity back into the equation, which is really important to them, and it's my favorite thing about Can the Cats. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of ways to help on campus with Can the Cats. Lots of like cool programs across campus. Dining's helping out a bunch. Athletics is helping out a bunch. Um, you can find it on their website as well. If you go to Missoula Food Bank or CanTheCats.com. Um, lots of information there. The goal this year is 406,000 pounds. We got almost 400,000 pounds last year, so I'm pretty confident we can do it again. Um, and again, one in five Missoulians use the food bank, so every can of food you're donating could possibly go to your neighbor or the kid you sit next to in class, or, you know, it's someone you know probably goes there, which is awesome that they get that opportunity and that Missoula Food Bank works so hard to make sure their assistance is equitable and accessible to everyone in Missoula. Um, and then here's my three great things that I think is really important. Uh, fight stereotypes. Harmful stereotypes make this problem worse. Someone coming in to your meeting and saying, oh, students don't know how to handle money, or oh, their parents paid for all of their school, they don't need that much help, or students have dorms, why are they homeless? Students have meal plans, why are they hungry? Those aren't true. College students look so different now than they did five, ten years ago. Um, Nothing I've done on my college campus is anything like what either of my parents did at NAU and at Gonzaga, at St. Louis, at Eastern Washington University. 
college is so different now, which is very cool. We have a lot more opportunities now than my parents were, had when they were in school, but we also tend to need a lot more help. So making sure you're reminding people when they're telling those jokes about ramen, when they're saying, oh, everyone's parents paid, whatever. Reminding them that, like, no, it's not what it's like. Um, and even if it's a simple joke, snide comment, one thing, one person understanding what they said was hurtful makes a huge difference. Um, if you need more advice on that, I'm so happy to talk about more. If you search the uh, Real College hashtag on Twitter, you'll see a lot of my tweets, you'll see a lot of my bosses and from sociology here, um, but you'll also get a lot of ideas and you'll also get a better understanding of what real college students look like. So I also recommend Sarah Goldrick Rabb's book, uh, Paying the Price. She talks a lot about how college has changed and uh, they followed a couple thousand students around to schools in Wisconsin. It was a longitudinal study. Um, and they followed them over the full four years and then after college as well. And it gave it, uh, reading that book is really eye opening and it'll give you a really good picture of what college is like now. Um, and then, any questions, any ideas? I want to talk more. We still have a good chunk of time left. I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. How do students access the emergency loan. I've heard about that, I think, in a training or something a few weeks ago, but I've never heard like, what the steps are to connect the student with it. So I know at least, because I work in the ASUM office, I'm a receptionist there as well, um, it's my second job. Uh, if someone comes in asking about the loan, we give them a phone number and it's someone in financial aid. Um, as far as I know, that's it. We don't advertise it, which I think is a problem. Um, and we don't really have like an easy, what, what, here's three steps to get help thing, um, working on it. So if I call financial aid and ask for it and get the phone number, I can just keep that in my office you can to also, take out an extra step for students. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Absolutely. Or you can come get it from the ACM desk downstairs. Um, yeah, because we, um, we don't ask. We just give you the number, which I think is awesome, not, trying to, not putting in another barrier. Because even if you're trying to prevent people who don't need it from using it, A, you don't know what that looks like. And B, it's going to put further barriers in front of people who actually need it. So yeah, if you can get creative and get scrappy like that and keep like a list of resources in your office or like I will give you my phone number um, or keep the Runner Center's number, like there's so many people on campus who can help you get connected to other resources. Get scrappy. It's really important. Good idea. Yeah? I, I don't have a question, but I wonder if you could speak to this sort of reality that I've encountered in working on this issue is like UM is obviously very worried about its enrollment, about its retention, and things like that. And one of the things I've seen, one of the unfortunate things I've seen is that bringing light to an issue like food insecurity mm. sort of is this stain in a way. Mm -hmm. So to make it more public, to talk about it, to sort of bring it out of shadows and have this conversation, to have a food pantry, to have it more visible, I think there's concern from a certain level that that then you know, might affect a student who's coming to tour the campus and they might say, this is, you know, do I really want to bring my son or daughter here if this is a problem? Yeah, um, yeah um, I can talk to speak to that more as a student than as someone who is in charge of anything on this campus, because I'm not. Um, but I know if I came to a campus and was touring and saw a food bank, I'd be so excited that people care about each other here and that, um, if I need help, it's available to me. And I know that's how my parents would feel as well. Um, but I think that points back to the bigger issue of stigmatization and assuming, um, oh, there are poor people here. Like, we, what if we get poor? What if, what if a poor person touches me? Um, there is, it points to a bigger issue of stigmatization and just a lack of awareness of what the real issue is, maybe. Um, and again, I don't know how to single-handedly solve the enrollment crisis. Um, what if I could? But I truly believe having those resources here should increase retention and enrollment simply because we have those resources. Um, if people come to school here knowing that like, hey, if I get in trouble, I will have help. Hey, someone genuinely cares about me. That would make me want to, it's why I came back here for grad school. Because students here and staff and faculty here care so much about each other. Um, it's, I'm a cry. <laughs> it's really awesome and I think I would really hope that that's the perception people have if they see the food pantry, if they see assistance programs in Missoula. Not that, oh, people are poor, like what if we get into a situation, um, or like making the assumption that pay's too low, housing's too high, 
it's a bad place to come. And like those things are true, but still, Missoula is an awesome place to live because people care. So that's my hope. Uh, I don't know how to fix it, but that's, yeah. Yeah, awesome. I just see it as kind of addressing the systemic fact that it is like those mm -hmm. other schools where two to fourteen percent or whatever that it is more than just two bad. Yeah. But look, it is here, and this is what we do. Mm -hmm. I think that really makes a big difference. It's that lack of knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't always take the Missoulian. Is it your sense that this particular issue is? Um, ever confronted in the Missoulian, or has anybody written a letter to the editor saying, you know, this is an issue on our mm -hmm. campus, it's an issue everywhere, but um, it, my sense is that because it's in the Cayman doesn't mean a whole, whole lot of people read it off yeah. campus, and well, it's good to have people on campus know that this is not going to change if only people on campus absolutely. know what the issue is. I don't know off the top of my head, um, I was mostly re researching stuff on campus, but like, we all could go write one right now. Yeah. Um, I'll do it. After, like I will. That's a really good idea. Um, especially because we need community partnerships. I'll grab you. And then. If you're writing the letter to Missoula, you should include the Missoula Current in that. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. One of my coworkers has a list of all the places to send LTE, so I will snag that from her. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna kind of like a response to your question. Absolutely. If, um, I mean, if like people are like coming to campus and seeing like we do have like the uh, programs that we have, they don't see that. Then I feel like that is a good issue that, you know, like, that, like the higher ups, like that they do, they are not feeling the pressure of the world and stuff like that. Yeah. They should you know, they feel that pressure. Like, yeah, if we don't have people because we don't care about our students, we should. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's the reason why I don't want to try to work out halfway through because we can't stay on campus to do the first grade and stuff like that. And they're just people would rather not, you know, like, when they're still in the so trying to like, make. And use that pressure to make change, actionable change. Absolutely, you're 100 percent right. So on the other hand, I also think it's about message. You know, if, if somebody walks by a food bank and they're wondering if the tour guide or the you know staff member is meeting with them, it's like, yeah, we're a really supportive campus to all types of mm -hmm. students. If that turns somebody off, they probably won't fit in here. Nope. So, <laughs> Absolutely. I think a lot. It's not like, oh, that's where the poor students go to get their food. That's not the message that we're sending. No. You know, as long as the messaging is appropriate, I think it will just further reinforce whether or not UM is a good fit for those prospective students. Absolutely. Well, I don't know how the school system operates here, mm -hmm. but I, I was just wondering, um, the person who is in charge of uh, recruitment, mm -hmm. enrollment, do they read student publication? I mean, is there a stu student paper? Yeah. Um, or can, can someone tell the person who's in charge of the enrollment? So I can speak to part of that. Um, through ASUM, I'm mentoring Kathy Cole, whose actual title is really, really long, but she's a marketing person and is working really hard on bringing more students to campus. Um, and she gets it. Like, she understands that students are facing these problems, and because I get to mentor her, if she ever forgot, I'd be there to remind her, but I have full faith that she doesn't. But we do have a student publication, that's the Montana Kaiman, um, that has written two stories about this um, and maybe hopefully we'll write more but um, I think we have to get the word out outside of campus as well so like people could come here and read the Kaiman and understand student lives here but um, it's two articles <laughs> right now so that's the bigger issue is that people don't know so we have to find a way to communicate that more especially as you're reaching out to prospective students you should tell them like hey and we have as you're listing like we have a library we have a gym we have a climbing wall and we have a food pantry and we have trio and we have this and that um i think it's really important at least for me and like i grew up with two social workers in my house i've been volunteering at food banks and pantries since i was in like first grade um so like i have a different perception than many people but i would be so excited when i was touring campus or if a school reached out to me and say hey to say hey we want you here look at all this awesome stuff we have Absolutely, it should include resources. Um, so I think, yeah, reaching out to prospective students and their parents and the community as a whole to say, A, this problem exists, and B, we're here to solve it. 
um, is really important. And hopefully more people start talking about it. And that's kind of the magic of the real college movement is that we're talking about this because it for so long went unresearched, unreported. Um, yeah. There is a group called UN Forward that meets on campus to discuss um, recruitment and retention. I don't know if Kathy Cole was involved in that at all. I haven't been to any of the meetings, but she they exist. <laughs> she came and spoke to you about recruitment. So what are some, um, think if you're not a student now, think back, or if you've never been a student, put yourself in those shoes, um, or if you are a student now especially, what else can we do? So we built a food pantry, we absolutely shouldn't stop there. And we're trying to think of what's the next step, what's, um, how do we address the bigger problem? Do you have any ideas of like, what do you wish you had? What do you wish you could see, like in a perfect world, if UM had a gazillion million trillion dollars? What's the next step? We have a food pantry, what now? I guess one thing that comes to mind for me is visibility. Yeah. Um, I know UN's going to be doing their first generation student um, celebration, uh, and you, you can self-identify as a staff member or as an alumni, and I'm not sure what exactly, I just got an email about it this week, um, what exactly their plan is, but it's coming up early in November, from like 9 to noon. I want to say this up, but I'm not sure. Um, but I think it's really important to have opportunities for students to see people who have been where they are at now and to see a path out of you know, the obstacles that they're in in college and to see that you know, things are attainable and to be connected with those resources. I don't know if they plan on speaking about resources for students um, at that event, but I think doing things like that for low income, um, housing inequality, things like that, important just for the social factors that go into into this problem. Absolutely. I, I just think centralizing the information and the distribution of a lot of these existing resources, getting the word out that you know you may be eligible for SNAP, you may be eligible for a basic needs scholarship, you may be eligible for um, or this is how you get to the food bank. I think this and looking at this and digging into this I've been blown away just about what resources are currently there, but people don't even know that they are there. Um, that seems like an, an easy first step is just to sort of bring all those together and find a, an efficient way to disseminate that information. Absolutely. I was thinking maybe an ombudsman or something like that. Somebody, one office, you'd have to hire a staff person, but make sure that all the students know that that person's there, and if they have any of these problems, they can show up. You know, I don't know that they think of that with, you're probably a student, you could say whether you think of that with your dean of students or whatever. And, and a student may think of a dean in one particular way and not be inclined to go and talk about this kind of issue or challenge, but if there were somebody who was just a student, I don't know what you call it, that would make it comfortable for students, a counselor or an assistance person or a support person or whatever, and if students really knew about it, then that would, you know, that would serve. Because right now, I mean, from my experience at the university, and I'm not a student, but dealt with them a lot, there's just not much that's very coordinated or well-known or anything like that, and this tends to get sort of pushed down to the bottom when everybody's worried about budgets all the time and recruitment all the time. I can tell you, um, in a perfect world, my dream, so right now I just got hired as a student coordinator for the UM Food Pantry, um, which I'm very excited about. This is my dream job, or at least part of it. Um, I think what would be the, not the perfect or the best solution, but like as a student who's been in those shoes, what I would have liked to seen the most would have been everything in one spot. Mm -hmm. I spent a ton of time at Curry for like health and counseling. I spent a ton of time with Sark, um, with the Renner Center. I've worked there, food bank. I've eaten there or gotten food from there. I need it all in one space. <laughs> every time someone comes in and asks for help or every time I went somewhere and asked for help and they said, awesome, go over there or awesome the office is that way or here's seven different phone numbers to call. I got so discouraged and often just didn't have the emotional energy or even the physical energy to walk one more time all the way across campus in February or to call one more number 
every time you add another thing to the list of things you need to do to get help, people drop off. That shouldn't happen. So like, in a perfect world, my dream job is to have a resource center on campus where everything is in one spot. The vet's office, TRIO, Curry, mental health services, SARC, food pantry, and more housing assistance should be in one building. Um, centralizing that information is so important. Even right now, just having one website or one poster all over the UC that says, hey, if you need help, here's where it is. Um, it'd be so important. And I know, like, I love that our campus is so big and beautiful, and I get to walk around it all the time, but when I'm in desperate need for help, I don't want to walk across one more time. And especially for students at Missoula College, Bitterroot West Campus, making sure they have equal access to those resources. They should absolutely not be put in, second class citizens is the wrong word, but they shouldn't be forgotten about. Um, there are a lot of resources lacking at all three of those campuses, and I know we're at least gonna have a satellite pantry at Missoula College. Let me know if you wanna get involved. Um, also like anyone else. But uh, it's so important to remember that those students are there, and staff and faculty are over there too, and they need help. Um, I've worked with a good few students over at West Campus, and I've heard from a lot of students over at Bitterroot that they have a lot of needs that they're just not, that are not being met over there, whether it's a lack of funding or people just forget that they exist. West Campus is like way out past the fort. Um, they do a lot of really awesome things. They have a sustainable construction program that builds houses for Homeward to give to people who can't afford houses. They're doing that, and they have students that can't afford to eat. Like, they, we can't forget about them. They have needs also. Um, so making sure moving forward that they're also involved in these conversations is so important. Um, and again, making sure that centralized information is accessible to them as well. Yeah. Anything else? Ideas? Fears? Yeah? I really like that idea you were saying before. Like, even if it's just in the syllabus, mm -hmm. like, here's all the information for them. Like, so it's Can awesome. you speak up? Yeah, like um, just with like the syllabus, like including all the um, like phone numbers or like here's where this information is, or even um, like with the on like coming information in that packet. Yeah. It, if it's like a, there's some saying like you can go to SNAP online, and, like, just include have, like an application for it. Like if kids actually have that information, if students have that information, they will be able to. Like, it's one step closer to them actually doing that. Also, the Runner Center, well, I'm only working there for two more weeks, but I'm qualified to do that. So if like you know people right now, and I'll keep doing it at the food pantry, um, that's a really important thing. That that application is so long and confusing and frustrating. Um, like, that's why you need people to help. So like, if you know people, send them to the Runner Center, send them to the food bank. Um, I know also in the food pantry, um, there is a training that you can do to be trained in how to assist people in applying for SNAP. I did it a few hours over the food bank. It's not hard once, you, uh, once you've seen the whole application and you understand how it works and what like keywords to use. Um, more people should be trained in doing that. So I agree. And like having a clear and easy way to see all those resources sent out. I remember the big old envelope you got when you get admitted to college. So remember, I was home alone and I saw it. I was like, I have no one to tell, but I'm in college. Um, there's a ton of information in it, but none of it was about resources. Um, so I agree, sending that out with orientation materials, sending it out of when people first get here is really important. Absolutely. Anything else? What's your favorite misperception of college students? Mine that I've heard recently is, um, oh, well, college students are poor because they spend all their money on beer. And like, no, maybe one or two people, but that is a very unfair stereotype to make of all of us. Is there anything really fun or funny? I love hearing these. I have a list on my phone of like crappy things I've heard about students. Nothing. It's good you haven't heard many then. Like, maybe we're changing. Um, yeah. So here are all my sources. Um, the TEDx talk was from 2017. That is Shantae Harris's story. Um, there's also Paying the Price, Sarah Goldrick Rapp's book, and then Sam Zucker's presentation on adding equity to human-centered design are probably like the top three things I used for this. Um, and I'm happy to send this to anybody. Um, if you want to stick around, I 
you want contact information uh, for me or if you have ideas, you want to hang out later, let me know. Um, again, at the front of the room, there are bags for Can the Cats. It's happening now. Please get involved. Um, food Bank needs your help. This is their biggest collection of food all year, and it lasts them to June. Um, so you can help at, at a couple of the dining locations on campus. I know the market's going to be selling pins for a dollar for Can the Cats. One dollar equals one can of food. Um, if you go to their website, there is lists of ways to help and also like lists of most needed items. Um, Thanksgiving's coming up. Donate a turkey. Is that a ham? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted the, the pin burner, actually, you can buy those pins anywhere, any dining operation on campus, even concessions at the basketball games for the two-week drive. So um, all, every dollar spent on those pins will go to the Can the Cats drive and go directly to the food bank. So it's an easy way if you don't I forgot to bring your food in, or you're busy, or whatever. You can buy them at the coffee shops. You can buy them at the corner store, um, all over campus. And I think Rock and Rudy's is also selling them. Um, and then that's all I know. But. And there's a. Um, I know the Trail 1033 is running. I think all their stations actually are running um, competition because the Cat Grizz game is sold out, or Grizz Cat, excuse me, is sold out. Um, but if you want to get a ticket, you can bring them five cans of food and they'll enter you to win, which is cool. So if you're a football person, that's an option for you. Um, I'm not going to the game. I'm going to be volunteering with the food bank for Can the Cats because I am not a football person. Um, but yeah, businesses all over Missoula are involved. Uh, Albertsons is going to have uh, donation bins for the rest of the Can the Cats. Walmart, they're going to have people tabling there. And when certain things go on sale, like go buy corn, go buy this thing. And if you can buy extra, donate them to us. Um, so yeah, Canada Cats is all over Missoula. Getting to be part of that planning committee was so much fun. Um, Amanda and all them over at the food bank are so much fun to work with. Um, Amanda's just the only name I remember, so there's other people that are equally cool. Um, there's also a radio ad on 103.3 running right now that has my voice. Please don't tell me if you've heard it. <laughs> really don't like hearing my voice on the radio. Um, but yeah, people all over Missoula get involved, and it's such a great reminder that Missoulians care about each other. Like Bozeman might have all the rich folks, but they are far <laughs> less philanthropic than we are. So uh, let's can the cats when we're here. But yeah, I'm here. Oh, also, tomorrow, tonight? Tonight is the Pumpkin Smash, which is ran by the Neighborhood Ambassadors. It's going to be at the Sigma New House. Um, if you have old pumpkins to get rid of, you can throw them on the ground, get those midterms nerves out of your way, um, and bring a can to participate. Or like a buck for which also will go to Kim and Cats. Um, yeah, so that information is also up on this table. But thanks, y'all. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.